You're listening to the Real Estate Runway Podcast, powered by Quattro Capital, where we are all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, the recovering engineer turned multifamily investor, Chad Sutton. All right, Real Estate Runway family, today we're going to have a land banking specialist on the call today. What is land banking? We're going to get right into it, talk about this interesting way for patient money to grow your wealth over time. This is a concept of buying land, holding it until it is ready to be developed or bought by someone in the future. The key here is due diligence, path of progress, buy in the right place. And this guy is going to help you figure out how to do that. So without further ado, let's get right into the show. But before we do, if you get any enjoyment out of the show whatsoever, please leave us a five-star review, a thoughtful comment. Those are worth their weight in gold. They really help us grow the show and get the word out. And if you want to apply to be on the show, please reach out to us at thequattroway.com slash podcast. And if you want to follow us on show, social media via our parent company, Quattro Capital, please visit us at Team Quattro Capital. One word, no special characters on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or visit us at thequattroway.com. And we love hearing from you. A lot of our episodes are actually responses to listener questions. So if you want to email us a question, at podcast at the quattroway.com. No question is too novice or too advanced to be answered here on the show. Happy to do it. So without that, with that being said, excuse me, it's Friday. Let's get into the episode and talk about some land banking. Here we go. All right, all right, all right. Real Estate Runway family, welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. Today, I'm, I'm very blessed to have Brad Warren on the show, land banking investment expert with Valer Enterprises. Brad, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Very well. Thanks for having me on, Chad. Excellent. Excellent. Well, before we get into talking about land banking as an investment and a way to build generational wealth in a safe manner, tell us a little bit about who you are. How did you come up in the business? You know, what, made, what makes Brad Brad today? And uh, you know, kind of what, what got you to the point that you're at in life today? Well, how much time do we have? No, I'll, I'll keep it short. <laughs> I was a business coach, seminar leader, and trainer for a little over 40 years. Traveled around the world, loved what I did. And five years ago, actually a week from, t a week from yesterday, so about six more days, will be my fifth anniversary of being a land banking specialist, land banking consultant. I've actually been investing in land for uh, 11 years, but actually selling land for five. And the way I got here, was I do a quarterly net worth statement, Chad, for my wife and I. I've actually been doing it since March of 1989 when we first met. And one quarter, it was December 31st, 2011. I remember like yesterday, I noticed when I looked at the numbers, I could not retire by myself. I could retire with my wife. She could retire by herself. She had an Oracle 401k company match, you know, poured money in, did great in the mutual funds, but I did not have enough money to retire myself. So I got my land bank friend, Marcella, Marcella Silva, she came to the house, did a presentation. My wife walked out, said, no, nope, not for me. I said, Marcella, I want a property. Get me one. I bought one in 2012, one in 2013, one in 2014. Then my wife went to hear her speak again. And, and the whole way in the car, she goes, now I'm not going to buy. I'm not going to buy. And we get there. And what happens? She buys two properties right there at the hotel. That was number four and five. We now own 11. And at some point, Marcella said, Brad, stop referring business to me, get your real estate license, and be on my team. And I jumped at the opportunity and that's how I got there. Very interesting. So let, let's talk about the concept of land banking a little bit. You know, I mean, it, for those who don't know what it is, it, it's going to sound like I'm literally putting land in a bank like money, but it's kind of that way. So <laughs> what is yeah. land banking, Brad? So the concept of land banking is to purchase land very inexpensively, very cheaply, that is strategically placed in the path of growth. So anybody could probably Google and find land, you know, a swamp in Florida or, you know, some other place and it's cheap, but is it in the path of growth? That's what we specialize in. We actually only invest in a 60 mile radius around downtown LA. Mm. People say LA, isn't the land very expensive there? Yeah, two to 7 million an acre if there is even any land in LA proper and there's not. So we're kind of like in the exurbs, the suburbs of the suburbs around Los Angeles, 
where we find these incredible deals. We make them available to our investors. They buy at a relatively low cost. Our minimum investment is 25000 That's how much it takes to get started. And you hold. We're very conservative. We tell people seven to 10 years. And then they exit by selling to the developer who has to have that land because it's right in the middle of 100 acres or 1,000 acres of a you know, 100 acres that they're, that they're building a, a housing development, or it could be a thousand acre solar farm. And you own just one little acre right in the middle, but you can stop the whole project from moving forward by holding onto your land and waiting till you get a really good exit price. So in a, in a nutshell, that's what land banking is. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So effectively you acquire all or a piece of land that you know, I think the key is, you know, it's in you know, a term we use here on the show a lot is path of progress. It, it, it's it's along the path where development will happen. Maybe planning is already happening, zoning. So, you know, how do you, especially around the the LA area, how do you determine, you know, where do I think developers are going to go next? And, and, and that's, that's really how you go find that land for cheap before anyone else knows it's got value, right? Yes. Excellent question. And we have something we call it the 10 growth factors or the 10 key indicators of growth. It's like a tsunami of economic trends all happening at the same time within that 60 mile radius. How do we know? Our CEO is a PhD economist. He's the son of the founder. This is all they've done for 43 years is they look at macro trends and micro trends. So macro would be the larger economic things like the move to electric cars. That's like a macro trend that's happening all over the world. Right. All the car manufacturers have said by 2025, by 2030, maybe even 2035, somewhere in that area, they're not going to be selling gas powered cars anymore. So that's like a macro trend. Well, when you see that happening, you figure, where are we going to get all that electricity? Where are we going to get it cheaply and so that it doesn't pollute the environment? Hello, solar. So we we find places where we know solar is going. Then on the micro level, we go to city council meetings. We follow reports, general plans, uh, zoning changes, and uh, infrastructure. When you see a city government putting $180 million of its money into widening the off-ramps off of the highway, you kind of got to ask yourself, why are they doing that? They know something about those off-ramps and that immediate area, like the four corners, you know, where the four gas stations usually go. That's prime real estate. And if they're widening the off-ramps and making it easier for people to get on and off, something must be coming. Housing, shopping center, who knows? So that, that's kind of on the micro level. We look for those trends and then we start buying up land all around that area that meets our criteria. We have a 16-point comprehensive analysis. And if it doesn't get all 16 yes check marks, we don't touch it. But if it does, we, we buy one out of every 30 that we look at. So we get that one, we make that available to the investor who holds it, and then they wait for that development to show up and reap very large returns, usually three to seven X return. That's that's incredible. And so you have just mentioned a very strong equity multiple, by the way. So you, you've got to got a process for figuring out what you know what land you want to be going after and and what development is coming that way. And so that's really part of your value that you bring to the table as the land banking investment, you know, consultant. So Tell me a little bit about, you, know, you mentioned the term investors a couple of times, right? Are you structuring these things as syndications? Are, are you actually acquiring the land and then aggregating the capital and servicing whatever costs you know come with that until it's time to sell it? Let's talk structure a little bit. How does that work? It's very simple. You buy it yourself or okay. you are allowed to, to go in with up to four non-family members and up to eight family members. Okay. So if they want to pool their money, obviously they could buy a bigger parcel, but on the downside, they've all got to agree when it comes time to sell. And if you've got eight family members and you're trying to reach a decision where you all agree, that could be a problem. Think sitting around the Thanksgiving table and all the arguments and all that. All right. So there's pros and cons. Most of my clients, I would say the vast majority are individual investors. Minimum investment is 25,000 up to 2 million. So I've had mm -hmm. people sort of in that range. The largest one I've ever sold was 750000 But most of mine are generally between fifty and 100 And it's usually maybe a married couple or just one investor. 
and they buy it. They get a fee simple deed that proves yeah. beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's their land. They own it. They can wave that deed around at people's faces saying, I'm the owner. You know, don't mess with my land. And then you have control over it and you can do what you want. My first purchase, actually, I didn't even have the minimum 25000 when I made my first purchase. It was $115,000 mixed use, one and a quarter acre parcel. And I only had enough to buy 17%. So Marcella, who I mentioned earlier, my, who was my land banker, now she's my business partner. She found three other people, one of whom I knew, the other two I'd never met. And between the three of us, I think it was 17, 17, 22, and 44%. So it wasn't even equal. We're, we're kind of, you know, all in there at different uh, price ranges. And so I'll, I'll get 17% of the profit. I won't get the full profit, but it's going to be fairly substantial because it's a mixed use property. And oh, by the way, the city council did us a favor. They rezoned the property. We didn't ask them, Chad. We did not ask them to do this. They rezoned the property from MU4 meaning mixed use four stories high to mm. MU5. It's like they gave us an acre and a quarter of free land, only they gave it to us vertically, not horizontally. So yeah. that property is now worth at least one multiple times. It's worth 115,000 more than it was before they passed the resolution. So we left business friendly city government, by the way, is one of those 10 economic factors that I said, one of those key indicators. You gotta be near, in a city where the government of that city is amenable to and actually courts businesses and development. They're not, you know, NIMBYs, not in my backyard. I mean, there's, there's places where near where I live, where for years, they even went against the state of California with a lawsuit trying to stop affordable housing being built. You don't want to do land banking in places like that. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Really, any real estate, right? You can't fight city hall. And so if, right. uh, if you're yeah, against, if you're against city, yeah, it's expensive, right? It takes a long it's time expensive. and it, it, it makes your hair turn very gray. I've lost hair over that in some areas of, <laughs> yes. of the country. So. <laughs> anyway, well, so tell me a little bit about, you know, we make this investment jointly or individually and, you know, we, we, it's not a cash flowing asset. It's an equity play. So, so what kind of a hold period are we looking at? What kind of costs do I need to think about? you know, over that whole period? Like, what does that look like as an owner? So in addition to the, let's say you're buying at the minimum $25,000, there is an escrow fee and it's graduated. It, it goes up as the price of the land goes up at that level with us. It's, I believe it's $800. So that's your initial cost. We pay for the title insurance. We pay for the natural hazard disclosure report. So that's a few hundred dollars of, of built in equity, so to speak, right there. So you're paying the 25800 to buy the land. Then you have your property taxes. And as I might have mentioned, maybe I didn't, we tell people very conservatively, seven to 10 years is an average hold period. Could be less, could be more, but you want to be in it for the long haul. So it's what we call patient money. Most of my clients actually use self-directed IRAs that are going to sit for 20 or 30, maybe they're in their 40s and that money's going to sit for 20 years, 25 before they're even allowed to take some out. So they'll use their self-directed IRA and just let it sit there. And not all of it. I, I'm not suggesting to anybody that they put all their money in the land, keep some in the stock market. In fact, now's the better time to buy now because it's pretty low. I, I, I lost a bunch there, but you know that's another whole story. Maybe you'll have me on another podcast and I'll <laughs> talk about that. But you... You buy and you wait. It's, it's a lazy man, lazy woman's investing. You buy it. You, you basically pay your property tax over the course of that seven, eight, nine years, whatever it is. And oh, by the way, did I forget to say that uh, Proposition 13 passed in California in 1976. Excuse me. It was passed in 78. It was retroactive to 76. It caps the, um, the highest uh, amount of tax that they can put on a property when it changes hands in the state of California is 1.3% of the sale value. But because it's empty land with no buildings on it, the county tax assessors never do the full 1.3%. So on a $100,000 property, you would think that would be what, $1,300? Well, no, they come in at like 400 or 500. So your carrying costs are a few hundred a year, even 500 a year, let's say over 10 years, that's $5,000. So you paid 105,000, your escrow fee and another five. That doesn't really matter when you're looking at triple and quadruple and quintuple returns. 
you don't really care so much about that little extra five. And that's it. When you sell, there are whatever the selling costs. And obviously you want the buyer to pay as many of those as possible. Uh, we also offer free negotiation coaching to all of our clients when they're ready to exit. And we help them get the maximum amount that they possibly can from that transaction. So we, we provide some help to people even after they bought from us. We don't just buy and say so long, kiss them off and never see you again. <laughs> We're in business together for a decade, conceivably, which is why I always say when people say, well, what, what's your ideal investor look like? They got to be nice. They got to be patient. And they have to have 25,000 liquid in order to invest. Then I'll talk to them. Otherwise, you're not nice. I don't need the money. Thank you very much. I'm semi-retired. <laughs> Take a hike. You know, it's not worth it, Chad. It's just not worth it to deal with, you know, nutcases. I hear you. So folks listening, be a nice person. That's the first, <laughs> the first step to business is don't be a pain in the butt. You know? Right. Right. <laughs> so fantastic. Well, let's talk a little bit about how, so we talked about having the cash to acquire it. You know, do we typically put loans on these properties? Do we buy them in cash? Is there any limitation to how I can buy the property? I mean, let's go into that a little bit. There's probably eight to 10 different ways you can do it. I've even, I haven't had anybody do this, but you could take cash out of a, like you could get an, adva uh, an advance from your life insurance policy and then pay yourself back later. Yeah. Uh, you have to pay it back, I believe with interest, but you're paying the interest to yourself anyway. So you wait until it sells and then you put the money back in there. I don't like doing it that. As somebody once asked me, can I do a HELOC? Can I take out a home equity line of credit on my house? I said, you could, but I won't sell you the land. Well, why not? Because you're going to be paying interest that's gone and it's going to be a lot of interest and you're going to be paying it maybe for 10 years and it's going to really jack up the price. Your, you know, your initial investment is now going to be maybe one and a half to two times what you paid. So now getting you to the three, seven X is going to be a lot harder. So yeah. most of my clients use self-directed IRAs. That's like the number one way. Uh, maybe a dormant 401k is another way. Cash and 1031 exchanges. I, in fact, I have two in escrow, yeah. even as we're speaking today, February 3rd, 2023, I have two in escrow right now, 50,000 and a 70,000, and they both are a 1031 exchange. Well, you know, the thing about land, they're not making any more of it. So it, this is, I, I love having you on the show here because this is, it's a supplemental strategy in your alternative investing, you know, journey. I mean, we, we all love cash flow. Cash flow is a great thing. But, you know, when we start looking at assets that are built out, we're pretty happy with a two to three X equity multiple, you know, when you actually get to the end of it, but you're getting cash flow and, and some tax benefits. It's a different game. Looking at, I mean, if you can start stashing away money, you don't have to eat off of. Right. This is kind of where you start getting into things. For example, land is always going to be in demand, especially if you have someone like Brad helping you place the right parcel in the right path of progress. That's a lot of P's there, parcel, parcel path of progress, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But so remember the P's, the P's of land banking. And so it'll make you, you prosper. It, There's another and one. And it'll make you prosperous. Look at that. But if you do that, this is where, like you said, you know, three to seven, and even I've seen much higher than that on multiples, depending if you get lucky and you really like maybe a, a development really turns out to be spectacular in an area and they really want that piece of land and you're the last person to hold out, you know? So actually speaking to that, Brad, how do you know when it's time to sell? How do you, you know, how do you like, uh, you're going to start getting offers probably all the time. Some might be wholesalers, some might be, you know, other guys trying to just acquire land, but how do you know? When is the right time to start thinking about selling that piece of land? Well, the first thing I tell my people is when you get an offer and they don't really come in right away, well, though, though I do know one, one client actually got, Valor had not closed escrow yet. So technically Valor, company I work for, still owned the property. And Valor got an offer letter that was way higher than what they were selling to the investor and they turned it away because of the level of integrity that we have. They just said to the, they said, once we've closed and our investor owns it, you can then talk to our investor. And then of course we help the investor. As an example, we have several people that are fairly close to each other in the, uh, what we call the green real estate area where we invest. So this is farmland, you know, non-residential agricultural land that's gonna go for a solar farm of some kind. And, and it's usually an energy company. Well, let's say you, Chad, own an acre 
and you get this email. It's usually an email or a letter from the energy company saying, hi, Chad, I see you bought uh, one and a quarter acres. It's located at such and so, and it was $25,000 and we'll offer you 30,000. And you've had it for, let's say two years. And you're like, wow, I just made five grand. This is great. You do not contact them. You send that email to me. I call the COO of the company. We start to strategize. He will tell me if other of our investors in the same area, like we might know the boundaries of that project. And if we've got other investors in there, they'll have already gotten offers. And some of them may have gotten offers for 60 or 80 or 90 or 120. And they're trying to steal your land for 30. So we'll give you this legal insider information. We'll give you a series of questions to ask. What is the land going for? Oh, you're building a solar farm. Does it have a name? What's the name of the project? When are you breaking ground? When, it, when will it go online? How many megawatts? We want to know how much money you're, they're going to make off of this land to get an idea of what it's worth to them. Uh, and so we give you all these questions. You then go back to the energy company. You start asking these questions. They're scratching their head going, oh, this Chad guy, he ain't selling for 30. We, we screwed up. We lowballed him and he ain't go for it. Then they go to 60. Well, now you're at 2X. A little over 2X. Nope, you're not in the range yet. Now, I can never say, if you say, Brad, I was just offered, what did I say? The original price was 25. 25 Let's say he yeah. offered you 125. You finally got it all the way up there. You're at 5X. And you say, Brad, should I sell? I'm at 5X. I'll make $100,000 in two years. And I'm going to 1031 exchange it and defer my taxes. Or it's in my IRA and I'll defer it that way. Or it's in my Roth and I won't pay any tax. We love the self-directed Roth. I cannot give you financial advice. I cannot say, yes, sell it. No, don't sell it. But I can give you what we call the code words. I'll say something like, Chad, that's an excellent price. Or Chad, based on what we know of other investors in that area, that is fair market value. Which basically is, yes, sucker, sell it. You're right in there with everybody else. We know somebody that sold for 120. 118, 123, you're at 125, you're right there. Now it's your land, you can try to squeeze out 130. It's called a nibble. Try to get a little, five more thousand out. But you could jeopardize the sale. They may, they may get cold feet themselves and say, well, this guy's too greedy. So that's kind of what we can do and what we can't do to help our investors is provide as much information as possible. Yeah, and that's fantastic. And I guess, you know, taking that a step further, Brad, if you guys are tracking the projects and everything that's happening in the area, you're going to know, hmm, is Chad's land right in the heart of that megawattage development or is it on a corner where if he negotiates too hard, they may just lop off that corner and say, the heck with this guy, you know? I mean, that, that's that's intel. You know, knowledge is power, folks. So take him up on this. But wow, well, this has been a, an, an action-packed episode and I'm, I'm just, I'm so impressed with what you guys have put together. This is truly land banking with confidence. I see your sign back there for those on YouTube listening to this you know, land banking with confidence and, uh, you know, just an incredible way to do it because the biggest way people get in trouble in real estate is they invest without the right knowledge or they run out of time or they run out of money, right? With these, obviously the, you know, the, it's mainly a cash injection. Your carrying costs are low, so you shouldn't run out of money, you know, and, and timing is not really a problem, but with land, the biggest problem you can run into is buying something that has no value, right? Because until it becomes something it really isn't a tangible asset you know with market value but you know someone's going to turn it into that so well well we when i'm asked by potential investors they say well brent i understand that you're trying to reduce the risk as much as possible but yes. what is the biggest risk in investing with you and your company and buying land and i if here it is if folks I'm on, if, if i'm on zoom with them i will point to them and i'll say you you the investor is the biggest risk because if you get tired of waiting and want to get out earlier than what we told you, then you're not going to reap the returns. One quick example, Marcella called me once. She, she told me about this story. She had a guy, I think he was five years in, hadn't had an offer, wanted to sell. She said, you're crazy. Have you been going on the free Tuesday night webinars? Do you know what your land is worth? He says, no. She says, trust me, less than a year later, he wound up negotiating the largest land lease 
that the company, per, the largest lease per acre that the company has ever seen. And wow. he'll make over a million something dollars on like a $30,000, $40,000 investment over 25 years. It's got a 2% built-in escalation clause. At the end of the 25 years, he still owns the land because they're just mm -hmm. leasing it. These are rare. But the guy called up Marcella and said, thank you. Thank God I listened to you. Uh, I know I can be impatient and, you know, five years seem like such a long time. But thank you for not letting me sell. And it's not that we didn't let him. He could have if he wanted, but he listened to us, the experts. And it turned out to be a very good financial move on his part. I'm going to let you have the mic drop moment on that one, Brad. That's a good way to conclude the episode. <laughs> Well, Brad, before we let you go, we've got to get to the quattro questions. Are you ready? I am ready. I don't know what they are, but I'm ready. <laughs> it's okay. This should be easy. First question. What is your superpower in life or business and how does it serve you? Wow. My superpower. Yeah. Well, the two come to mind. One is my sense of humor and how it's helped me is I just laugh. I laugh a lot. <laughs> the people that I work with, you see, you just laugh now. I crack a lot of jokes. I keep it light because if it ain't fun, it ain't worth doing. Amen uh, to that. And I would say I have a lot of training in how to listen. And I don't just listen to somebody. I listen for something. Meaning I'm not just listening to the words coming out of their mouth. I'm listening to what do they stand for? What are they reaching for? What is behind? What are, what are they not saying? So I listen for something rather than just listen to something. That's really good. And, you know, the power of laughter, I mean, as you just saw, it's contagious, right? You get people yeah. smiling and they're not emotionally in a corner. It's a good thing. So, well, let's yeah. go the other direction, Brad. What's your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? Could be life or business, but yeah. Oh, Chad, I'm 72 years old. I've had so many. <laughs> I can't tell you. That. I would say one of them was investing in a brick and mortar photocopy store. The first one went really, really well. And the guy that was running it said, let's open a second store. And I was a little hesitant, didn't trust my gut, didn't do enough research. And this was right around 2008, 2009. So you kind of know what happens next. And that one opened and didn't do so well. It started sucking money away from the first one. And my wife and I lost, uh, I forgot the number. I've been trying to forget the number because it's so big. It was, you know, it was low six figures, but it was a, it was a jolt. It was a big loss mm. for us at the time. And uh, fortunately we've recovered through laughter and, you know, joking about it, but it was very, I lost a lot of sleep at the time. So yeah. do your due diligence, folks. Do I was your about to say, what did you learn from it? Those two, the, I those two yes. letters. <laughs> Research, research, research. Don't go with your gut. I mean, sometimes gut's useful, but more often than not, you know, if we had looked at the trends, if we looked at where the world was going at the time, if we had looked at the whole experience of photocopying and that, we would have seen that, no, stick with the one. Let's make this one successful. Let's get our initial investment back first before we start plowing money into a second one. Yeah. Yeah. Do your good, homework. good lesson. Good lesson. All right. Well, I know you also have an ebook that's available to the listeners. So what is that and where might they find it? Yeah, I wrote this when I was actually a real estate business coach. I worked for Keller Williams for several years and uh, was on my own for several years. And I wrote a book called Just Sold, The Real Estate Professional's Guide to Selling More in Less Time. And while it's focused on real estate professionals, if you take out that word everywhere it appears in the book and substitute entrepreneur, CPA, plumber, it doesn't matter. The principles that I teach in the book are all about how to lead generate, how to run better meetings, how to manage your time better, how to time block your week, how to write goals in a powerful way such that they actually get accomplished, not confusing activity with accomplishment. And I can send the ebook to anybody that just sends me an email, brad at bradwarren.com. It's just my name, brad at bradwarren.com and just put Chad in the subject line, free ebook, something like that. So I know where they're coming from. I always like to thank the person that refers me because all of my business is by referral. So I want to thank you for sending them to me and I'll send them, I'll just email them the, the free book. 
Fantastic, folks. And if you're driving down the road, as always, just take that thumb and scroll right on down in whatever mo modality you're listening to this episode. Brad's email and contact will be right there for you, so no worries. Last question, Brad. Here at Quattro, one of our four pillars is philanthropy. People, property, profits, and philanthropy, helping people. So it comes all the way back full circle, you know? Tell us about your uh, your philanthropic heart, and you'd be surprised. A lot of times we get reports of people who actually listen to this show and go in, and donate to a philanthropy you know, in your name that, that speaks to them. So what are you into? Well, two of my pet projects right now are Meals on Wheels, which most people know is uh, I take food and go to seniors who are either by choice or not basically shut in. They really can't get out. And this could be the only meal that they get the whole day. I might be the only live human being they see all day. So I volunteer with Meals on Wheels. And I also uh, actually created a position with the local Red Cross uh, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm, what am I called? A community outreach specialist. And I give talks, free talks, either Zoom or in person, about the need for more blood donors, especially because of COVID. COVID basically shut it down. They couldn't go, you couldn't go in live and donate blood. Well, guess yeah. what? The need for blood doesn't stop just because of COVID. And so I talk to Kiwanis Club, Rotary, a Moms Club, you know, a soccer club. It doesn't matter. I can do it on Zoom. It's 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how much time they'll give me. And it's just talking about how easy it is to donate, where to go, what the process is. Uh, did you know, Chad, that for every pint that you donate, you actually can save up to three lives with that one pint because they break it up and use it for different things. So. American Red Cross and Meals on Wheels. I love that, Brad. Well, thank you for coming on the Real Estate Runway podcast, Brad. This has been a fantastic episode talking about the concept of land banking in a safe and guided way. Like what what a what a concept. I didn't know this existed. So thanks for coming on and sharing your your knowledge and resources. And folks, you've got Brad's contact. If this is interesting to you, scroll down, reach out to him. Anyone who comes on this show you know, is vetted because we, uh, you know, we, we care about you, the listener, want to make sure you're getting good quality opportunities to invest your money. So with that being said, this has been another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. Brad, thank you so much, sir. See you next time. All right, Real Estate Runway family. That was a pretty interesting episode. Awesome to learn about land banking with Brad Warren. So reach out to him if that, if you think that's something that can help you grow your wealth and fit your personal investment strategy. Remember it's patient money. You know, this is not a cash flowing asset, but it is something where you can get a pretty decent return by a little bit of speculation with knowledge behind it. So that being said, thanks for being with us today. Leave us a review if you got any enjoyment out of that episode, and we'll talk to you on the next show. Have a great weekend, everybody. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway Podcast.